Story 19 of The Best British Short Stories of 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The Best British Short Stories of 1922 by Various. Story 19. Empty Arms by Roland Pertwee from the Ladies' Home Journal, 1922. There was a maroon wallpaper in the dining room abundantly decorated with sweeping curves unlike any known kind of vegetation. There were amber silk sashes to the Nottingham lace curtains in the huge bow window, and an amber winding sheet was wrapped about the terracotta pot in which a tired aspidistra bore forth a yearly leaf. Upon the Brussels carpet was a massive mahogany dining table, and facing the window a Georgian chiffonier, brass railed and surmounted by a convex mirror. The mantelpiece was draped in red serge, ball fringed. There were bronzes upon it and a marble clock, while above was an overmantel columned and bemirrored, upon the shelves of which reposed sorrowful examples of Dalton ware and a pair of wrought-iron candlesticks. It was a room divorced from all sense of youth and live beings, sunless, grave, unlovely, an arid room that bore to the nostrils the taint and humor of the tomb. From somewhere near the Edgware Road came the clot-clot of a late four-wheeler and the shake and rumble of an underground train. The curtains had been discreetly drawn, the gas turned off at the meter, and an hour had passed since the creaking of the old lady's shoes and the jingle of the plate basket ascending the stairs had died away. A dim light from the street lamp outside percolated through the blinds and faintly illuminated the frame and canvas of a large picture hanging opposite the mantelpiece. It was a beautiful picture, a piece of perfect painting, three figures in a simple curve of rocks, lit as it were by an afterglow of sunset. In the center was a little Madonna draped in blue and gold. Her elbows were tight to her sides, and her upturned palms with their tender curving fingers were empty. It seemed almost as though they cradled someone who was not there. Her mouth was pulled down at the corners, as is a child's at the edge of tears, and in her eyes was a questing and bewildered look. To her right, leaning upon a slender staff, was the figure of St. John the Baptist, and upon his face also perplexity was written. A trick brushwork had given to his eyes a changing direction, whereby at a certain angle you would say he was looking at the Madonna, and again that he was following the direction of her gaze out into unknown places. His lips were shaped to the utterance of such a word as why or where. It seemed as though the two were in a partnership of sorrow or of search. The third figure was of St. Anne, standing a little behind and looking upward, a strange composition, oddly incomplete, giving an impression of sadness, of unrest, and of loss irredeemable. A clock was chiming the parts of an hour when the little Madonna stepped from the frame and tiptoed across the room. To her own reflection in the mirror opposite, she shook her head in a sorrowful negative. She peeped into a cupboard and behind the draperies of the mantelpiece, but there was nothing there. She paused before an engraving of Raphael's holy family, murmured, Happy Lady, and passed on. On a small Davenport table next to one of the two inexorable armchairs, she found the old lady's work-basket. That was a great piece of good fortune, since nightly it was locked away with the tea and stamps and other temptations that might persuade a soul to steal should opportunity allow. In the many years of her dwelling in the house, but three times only had she found it unguarded. There are glorious possibilities in a work-basket. Once she had found wool there, 
not carded, but a hank of it, soft, white, and most delicate to touch. To handle it had given her the queerest sensation. She had shut her eyes, and it had seemed to weave itself into the daintiest garments, very small, you understand, and with sleeves no longer than a middle finger. But it was a silly imagining, for not many days afterward, looking down from the canvas, she had seen the old lady, with her clicking ivory needles, knit the wool into an ugly pair of bed-socks. Quite a while she played in the basket that night. She liked the little pearl buttons in the pill-box, and the safety pins were nice, too. Kind and trustworthy pins they were, to hide their points beneath smooth round shields. She felt it would be good to take some of them back in one of her empty hands, and hide them in that little crevice of rock under the juniper tree. It was the banging of a front door opposite, and the sound of running footsteps, that moved her to the window. She drew back the curtain and peeped out across the way. There were lights in an upstairs window, and a shadow kept crossing and recrossing the blind. It was a nice shadow, and wore a headdress like her own, except that it was more sticky out. The hall, too, showed a light, and, looking up the street, she saw a maidservant, running very fast, disappear round the corner. After that there was silence for a long time. In the street no one moved. It was deserted, empty as the little Madonna's arms, and dark. A fine rain was falling, and there were no stars. The sound of distant traffic had died away. The last underground train had drilled its way through sulphurous tunnels to the sheds where engines sleep. She could not tell what kept her waiting at the window. Perhaps it was the moving shadow on the blind, perhaps a prescience a sense of happenings near at hand, wonderful yet frightening. A thousand other times she had looked across the street in the dead of night, only to shake her head and steal back sorrowfully to her canvas. But to-night it was different. There was a feeling of promise, as though the question that she ever asked with her eyes might at last be given an answer. The front door opened a second time, and a man came out, and though he was quite young, he looked older than the world. He was shaking and very white. His hair was disordered and straggled across his brow. He wore no collar, but held the lapels of his coat across his throat with trembling fingers. Fearfully he looked up the street where the maid had gone then stamped his foot on the paving stones, and with his free hand rubbed his forehead and beat it with his knuckles. "'Oh, will he never come!' she heard him cry, and the words echoed through her as though they had been her own. If it was a prayer he had uttered, it was swiftly answered, for at the moment the maid and a bearded man came round the corner at a fast walk. The bearded man had a kind face and broad shoulders. She did not hear what passed between them, but the bearded man seemed confident and comfortable and compelling, and presently he and the maid went into the house, while the other man leaned against the railings and stared out before him at a tiny star which had appeared in a crack between the driven clouds. Lonely and afraid he looked and strangely like herself. The misery of him drew her irresistibly. Always before she had shunned the people of every day, having no understanding of their pleasures or sorrows, seeing little meaning in their lives or deaths. But here was a mortal who was different, who was magnetic, and almost without realizing she passed out of the house, crossed the road, and stood before him, the corners of her cloak draped across her arms. He did not seem aware of her at once, and even when she spoke to him in Italian of the Renaissance he did not hear. So she spoke again, and this time in English. What is it? He started, rubbed his eyes, blinked at her, and answered, Hello, who are you? What is it? she repeated. H have you lost something? 
"'Don't, don't,' he pleaded. "'Don't even suggest such a thing, little lady.' "'I won't. I only thought, and you look so sad.' "'Be all right directly. It's the waiting. Kind of you to stop and speak to me.' His eyes strayed over the gold and blue of her cloak. "'Been to a theatre? he asked. She shook her head and looked up at him with a child's perplexity. "'A play?' he amended. "'I've no one to play with,' she answered simply. "'See?' And she held out her empty arms. "'What's wrong, then?' "'I don't know.' She seemed to dwell on the last word. "'I only thought perhaps you could tell me.' "'Tell you what?' "'Help me to find it, perhaps. It seemed as if you were looking, too. That's why I came.' "'Looking?' he repeated. I'm waiting, that's all. Me too, but it's such a long time, and I get no nearer. Nearer to what? Finding. Something you lost? I think so. Must be. I'll go back now. He put out a hand to stop her. Listen, he said, it'll be hours before I shall know. I'm frightened to spend them alone. Be a friend, little lady, and bear me company. Tisn't fair to ask, but if you could stay a little. I'll stay, she said. And will you talk to me? Yes. Tell me a story, then, just as if I were a kid, a child. A man isn't much more these times. At the word child, her arms went out to him, but dropped to her sides again as he said, A man. Come under the porch, where the rain won't spoil your pretty silk. That's better. Now tell away. They sat side by side, and she began to talk. He must have been listening for other sounds, or surely he would have been bewildered at the very beginning of what she told. It's hard to remember when one was alive, but I used to be, yes, hundreds of years ago. I lived can't remember very well. There was a high wall all around, and a tower and a bell that rang for prayers, and long, long passages where we walked up and down to tell our beads. Outside were mountains with snow caps like the heads of the sisters, and it was cold as snow within, cold and pure as snow. I was sixteen years old and very unhappy. We did not know how to smile. That I learnt later and have forgotten since. There was the skull of a dead man upon the table where we sat to eat, that we might never forget to what favour we must come. There were no pretty rooms in that house. What would you call a pretty room, he asked, for the last sentence was the first of which he was aware. I don't know, she answered. I think a room with little beds and wooden bars across the window, and a high fender would be a pretty room. We have been busy making such a room as that, he said. There's a wallpaper with pigs and chickens and huntsmen on it. But go on. There were iron bars to the window of my cell. He was very strong and tore them out with his hands as he stood up on the saddle of his horse. We rode into Florence as dawn broke, and the sun was an angry red. While we rode, his arm was around me and my head upon his shoulder. He spoke in my ear, and his voice trembled for love of me. We had thrown away the raiment of the sisterhood to which I had belonged, and as I lay across the saddle, I was wrapped in a cloak as crimson as the sun. "'Been reading Tennyson, little lady?' asked the man. She did not understand, and went on. It was a palace to which he brought me, bright with gold, mosaic, and fine hangings that dazzled my eyes after the grey they had been used to look upon. There were many servants and richly clad friends who frightened me with their laughter and the boldness of their looks. On his shoulder he bore me into the great dining-hall, 
where they sat awaiting us, and one and all they rose to their feet, leaping upon stools and tables with uplifted goblets and shouting toasts. The noise was greater than any I had heard before, and set my heart a-beating like the clapper of the convent bell. But one only stayed in his chair, and his looks were heavy with anger. At him the rest pointed fingers and called on him derisively to pay the wager and be glad. Whereat he tugged from his belt a bag of gold which he flung at us as though with the will to injure. But he who held me caught the bag in his free hand, broke the sealed cord at the neck of it, and scattered the coins in a golden rain among the servants. After this he set me by his side at the board, gave me drink from a brimming goblet, and quails cooked in honey from wild bees, and silver dishes of nectarines and passion-fruit. And presently, by twos and threes, the guests departed, singing and reeling as they went, and he and I were left alone. Alone, she repeated, shuddering. Did you hear anything? said the young man, raising his head. A cry? A little cry? No. I can hear footsteps moving up and down. Doctor's boots always creak. There! Listen! It was nothing. What were you saying? Twice in the months that followed I tried to run away, to return to the convent, but the servants whom I had counted my friends deceived me, and I was brought back to a beating, brought back strapped to his stirrup iron, as I might have been a Nubian slave. Long since he had ceased loving me. That lasted such a little while. He called me Madonna as though it were a term of shame, and cursed me for coldness and my nunnery ways. He was only happy when he read in my face the fear I held him in and I was always afraid. Afraid, echoed the man. Until tonight I was never afraid. And then my baby came, and I was not afraid any more, but contented all through. I carried him always in my arms by day and night, so pink and little and with a smile that warmed like sunshine. She paused and added plaintively, it's hard to remember when one was alive. My hands, my arms have forgotten the feel of him. I wish, said the man, I'd had a second opinion. It might have frightened her, though. Oh, heaven, how much longer! Oh, don't mind me, little lady. You're helping no end. You were speaking of baby, yes? He killed my baby, said the little Madonna because he had killed my fear of him. Then, being done with me, he threw me out in the streets alone. I thought to end it that night, because my arms were empty, and nothing could be good again. But I could not believe the baby was indeed gone. I thought if I searched I would find him in the course of time. Therefore I searched the city from end to end, and spoke with mothers, and peeped into nurseries, and knocked at many doors. And one day a door was opened by a man with great eyes and bronze hair swept back from his brow, a good man. He wore a loose smock over his doublet, smeared with many colors, and in his left hand he held a palette and brushes. When he saw me, he fell back a pace, and his mouth opened. Mother of mercy, he breathed, a real Madonna at last. His name was Andrea del Sarto, and he was a painter. I am a painter too, said the young man, forgetting his absorption at the mention of a great name. He brought me into his room, which was bright with windows and a fire. He bade me tell my story, and while I spoke, never once did his eyes desert me. When I had ended, he rose and walked up and down. Then he took from a chest a cloak of blue and gold, and draped it round me. Stand upon that throne, Madonna, said he, 
and I will put an infant in your arms that shall live down all the ages. And he painted me. So with the child at my breast, I myself had passed into the picture and found contentment there. When it was finished, the great ones of many cities came to look upon it, and the story of how I came to be painted went from mouth to mouth. Among those who were there was he who had taken me from the nunnery, and seeing me in perfect happiness, a fury was born in him. I was hidden behind a hanging, and watched the black anger rising up and knotting his brow into ugly lines. He bought the canvas, and his servants carried it away. But since the child was in my arms for all time, it mattered little to me. Then one night two men came to my lodging, and without question took me across the city and led me into the palace where I had lived with him. And he came forward to meet me in the great hall. There was a mocking smile on his lips, and he pointed to a wall upon which a curtain was hanging. I took away that child, he said, because you valued it higher than the love of man. Look now. At a gesture a servant threw back the hanging and revealed the picture. The babe was gone, and my arms crooked to cradle him were empty with the palms upturned. I died then, to the sound of his laughter I died, and looking down from the canvas I watched them carry me away. And long into the night the man who twice had robbed me of my child sat at the long table staring out before him, drinking great draughts and sometimes beating the boards with his bare fists. As dawn broke he clapped his hands and a servant entered. He pointed at me with a shaking hand. Take it away, he cried, to a cellar, and let masons brick up the door. He was weeping as they carried me down to the dark beneath the house. What a strange being you are, said the young man. You speak as though these were real memories. What happened to the picture then? I lay in the dark for so long hundreds of years, I think, and there was nowhere I might look. Afterward I was found and packed in a box and presently put upon the wall in the sad room where everything is so old that I shall not find him there. This is the furthest I have dared to look. Help me find him, please. Won't you help me find him? Why, little lady, he answered soothingly, how shall I help? That's a woman's burden that heaven isn't merciful enough to let a man share. He stopped abruptly and threw up his head. Did you hear that? There? Through the still early morning air came a faint, reedy cry. The young man was upon his feet, fiercely fitting a key into the lock. The little Madonna had risen, too, and her eyes were luminous like glow-worms in the dark. He's calling me, she cried. He's calling. Mine, said the young man. She turned to follow, but the door closed between them. To the firm of Messrs. Ridgewell, Ridgewell, Hitchcock, and Plum was given the task of disposing of the furniture and effects of the late Sabina Prestwich, spinster, of 22A Cambridge Avenue, Hyde Park West. As Mr. Ridgewell, Jr., remarked to Mr. Plum, while engaged in compiling the sale list and supplying appropriate encomiums to describe an upright grand by Rubenthal, Berlin, Victorian muck, lucky if we clean up 250 on the lot. Mr. Plum was disposed to agree. Though I must say, he added, it wouldn't surprise me if that picture was worth a bit. Half a mind to let old Kinnegie have a squint at it. Please yourself, responded Mr. Ridgewell, Jr., but to my mind it's ten guineas for nicks. It was the chance discovery of an old document, 
amongst a litter of receipts and papers that persuaded them to engage an expert opinion. The document stated that the picture had been discovered bricked up in a Florentine cellar some fifty years before, and had been successfully smuggled out of Italy. But the man who found it died, and it passed, with a few other unvalued possessions, to Sabina Prestwich, now deceased. The result of Eden Kennedy's visit to the house in Cambridge Avenue was the immediate transference of the canvas to Sotheby's sale rooms, a concerted rush on the part of every European and American connoisseur, a threatening letter from the Italian Foreign Office, some extravagant bidding, and the ultimate purchase of the picture for the nation, after a heated debate on the part of twenty-two royal academicians and five painters of the new school, who would have accepted death rather than the letters R.A. after their names. Extensive correspondence appeared in the leading papers, Persons wrote expressing the opinion that the picture had never been painted by del Sarto, that it was the finest example of his work, that the price paid was a further example of government waste, and that the money would have been better employed repairing the main road between Croydon Town Hall and Sydenham High Street, the condition of which constituted a menace to motorcyclists. For nearly ten days, scarcely a single publication appeared that failed to reproduce a comment or criticism upon the subject. But strangely enough, no single leader, writer, or casual contributor remarked upon the oddness of the composition or the absence of the infant from the Madonna's arms. In the course of time, that is to say, on the eleventh day, the matter passed from the public mind a circumstance explainable, perhaps, by the decent interment of the canvas in the National Gallery, where it affected no one save those mysterious folk who look at pictures for their pleasure, and the umbrella-less refugee who is driven to take shelter from the fierceness of storms. The little Madonna was placed upon a south wall, whence she could look out upon a brave company and sometimes people would pause to gaze at her, and then shake their heads, and once a girl said, How sad she looks! I wonder why! And once a little old lady with industrious hands set up an easel before her and squeezed little twists of color upon a palette, then thought a long time, and pursed her lips, and puzzled her brow, and finally murmured, I could never copy it! It's so, so changing, and she, too, went away. The little Madonna did not dare to step from her frame at night, for other mothers were at hand cradling their babies, and the sound of her footfalls might have wakened them. But it was hard to stay still and alone in that happy nursery. She could see through an archway to the right a picture Rubens had painted, and it was all aglow with babies like roses clustered at a porch, fat, dimpled babies who rolled and laughed in aerial garlands. It would have been nice to pick one and carry it back with her. Yet perhaps they were not really mother's children, but sprites and joys that had not learned the way to nestle. Had it been otherwise, surely the very call of her spirit must have brought one leaping to her arms. And then one day came a man and girl who stopped before her. The girl was half child, half woman, and the man gray and bearded, but with brave blue eyes. It was seventeen years since the night she had stolen across the way and talked with this man in his hour of terror but time did not cloud the little Madonna's memory with the dust of forgetfulness. "'That's the new del Sarto,' said the girl, who was reading from a small blue book. "'See, Daddy?' Then the man turned and looked at her, fell back a step, came forward again, passed a hand across his mouth, and gasped. "'What is it?' asked the girl. He did not answer at once. Then— the night you were born, he said, 
I'm certain. It's, it's Del Sarto, too. And the poor empty arms, just how she looked, and I closed the door on her. Daddy, what are you saying? There was a frightened tone in the girl's voice. It's all right, dear, don't mind me. I must find the keeper of the gallery. Poor little lady. Run back home. Tell your mother I may be late. But, Daddy, there are more things in heaven and earth, he began, but did not finish. It seemed as though the Madonna's eyes were pleading to him, and it seemed as if he could still hear her say, Help me find him, please. He told his story to the committee of the National Gallery, and to do them credit it was received with the utmost courtesy. They did not require him to leave them while their decision was made. This was arrived at by a mere exchange of glances, a nod answered by a tilt of the head, a wave of the hand, a kindly smile, and the thing was done. As the chairman remarked, we must not forget that this gentleman was living at the time opposite to the house in which the picture was hanging, and it is possible that a light had been left burning in the room that contained it. Those of us who are fathers, and I regret for my own part that I cannot claim the distinction, will bear me out that the condition of a man's mind during the painful period of waiting for news as to his wife's progress, is apt to depart from the normal and make room for imaginings that in saner moments he must dismiss as absurd. There has been a great deal of discussion and not a little criticism on the part of the public as to the committee's wisdom in purchasing this picture, and I am confident you will all agree with me that we could be responsible for no greater folly than to work upon the canvas with various removers on the bare hypothesis, unsupported by surface suggestion, that the Madonna's arms actually contain a child painted in the first intention. For my own part, I am well assured that at no period of its being has the picture been tampered with and it is a matter of no small surprise to me, sir, that an artist of your undoubted quality and achievement should hold a contrary opinion. We are greatly obliged for the courtesy of your visit, and trust that you will feel after this liberal discussion that your conscience is free from further responsibility in the matter. Good day. That was the end of the interview. Once again the door was slammed in the little Madonna's face. That night the man told his wife all about it. So you see, he concluded, there is nothing more I can do. But she lay awake and puzzled and yearned long after he had fallen asleep, and once she rose and peeped into the room that used to be the nursery. It was a changed room now, for the child had grown up, and where once pigs and chickens and huntsmen had jostled in happy farmyard disorder upon the walls, now there were likenesses of Owen Ares and uh, Henry Ainley obligingly autographed. But for her the spirit prevailed, the kindly bars still ribbed the windows, and the sense of sleeping children still haunted the air. And she it was who told the man what he must do, and although it scared him a great deal, he agreed, for in the end all good husbands obey their wives. It felt very eerie to be alone in the National Gallery in the dead of night with a tiny electric lamp in one's buttonhole and a sponge of alcohol and turpentine in one's hand. While he worked, the little Madonna's eyes rested upon him, and it could hardly have been mere fancy that made him believe they were full of gratitude and trust. At the end of an hour the outline of a child, faint and misty, appeared in her arms, its head, circled by a tiny white halo, snuggling against the curve of her little breast. Then the man stepped back and gave a shout of joy, and remembering the words the painter had used, he cried out, I will put an infant in your arms that shall live down all the ages. 
he had thought perhaps there would come an answering gladness from the madonna herself and looked into her face to find it and truly enough it was there her eyes which for centuries had looked questingly forth from the canvas now drooped and rested upon the baby her mouth so sadly downturned at the corners had sweetened to a smile of perfect and serene content but the men will not believe he washed away the sadness of her looks with alcohol and turpentine i did not touch the head i am certain i did not he repeated then how can you explain oh heaven he answered put a child in any woman's arms End of story 19